Good morning, and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I'm the Reverend Mandy Beal. I'm this congregation's senior minister. I'm joined in worship leadership this morning by our co-directors of music and ministry, Abha and Stephen Deering. We also have the support, the important support of our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis, as well as our Zoom greeter, Mary Jo Ebert. BUC is a spiritual home for all people of goodwill. We are a congregation of many beliefs, many backgrounds and identities. Our social justice work this year is focused in four areas, racial justice, environmental justice, economic inequality and civic engagement. We are a green sanctuary congregation, which is about our commitment to our planet. We are also a welcoming congregation, which is about our commitment to LGBTQ inclusion. More information about those designations can be found on our website. Our services are held on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030 and then later posted to Facebook. After the service, we invite you to stay for a virtual coffee hour. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today, we extend a special welcome to you. We hope that you'll stay after the service and get to know us. We have two announcements this morning. First, this Tuesday, October 6th at 7 p.m., we begin our first monthly Vesper service on Facebook Live. Vespers are evening services that center gratitude and introspection. The service will include candle lighting and remembrance of beloved dead and any concerns that might be on your heart. Names and information for candle lighting can be submitted on our website or they can be shared during the Facebook Live service. To join that service on Tuesday, visit BUC's Facebook page at 7 p.m. Our second announcement this morning is about SOS. Due to COVID-19, South Oakland Shelter's host congregations are not housing any guests in their buildings this year. Instead, host congregations are supplying meals for SOS guests. The BUC SOS leadership team has opted to finance the food rather than manage the COVID safety related issues of preparing and delivering meals. We'll be joined in this effort by our usual partner congregations, including the Muslim Unity Center, UU Church of Farmington, Northwest UU and Beacon UU. Our target goal of $7,000, it will be due by the 25th of October. Donations in any amount are gratefully accepted. Those contributions can be made through the BUC website or by check that is made out to BUC with SOS host in the memo line. Checks can be mailed into the office. Thank you again for joining us this morning or whenever you're watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit, and it is good to be together again. With that, our service will begin. This morning's prelude is called Village Dance, a traditional folk piece from Eastern Canada, arranged by Claude Gagnon. <laughs> worship from our separate homes this morning, but we are joined by a multitude of Unitarian Universalists in lighting our chalice. We light this chalice as a beacon of hope in a time of confusion and fear. In all things, in all times, may we be guided by love. This morning's first hymn is Blessed Spirit of My Life, and I invite you to stand as you're willing and able to join us and clap along on this grooved out version. Hear the still small voice. 
Our opening to words are by Tim Cayley. Amid all the noise in our lives, we take this moment to sit in silence, to give thanks for another day, to give thanks for all those in our lives who have brought us warmth and love, to give thanks for the gift of life. We know we are on our pilgrimage here, but a brief moment in time. Let us open ourselves here, now, to the process of becoming more whole, of living more fully, of giving and forgiving more freely, of understanding more completely the meaning of our lives here on this earth. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to create a free and welcoming religious community that encourages life of integrity, learning, service, and joy. This is the work to which we give our time, talent, and treasure. So let there be an offering of support for this beloved community and our good works. Contributions can be made through our website and through Venmo, username at BUCMI. You can also send a check in the mail. In an act of love and support our congregation, I invite you to give generously. The offertory music this morning is a song originally by the Alternate Roots. The Sound Messengers recorded this song, engineered by co-director of music Stephen Deering. We have Brian Shandoval on drums, David Urasek on bass, Stephen Deering on guitars, Amy Smalley backup vocals, and myself on vocals. Here is Nothing More.
what a fun special treat that was. In recognition of the ways that we treat each other and how it makes us who we are, we enter now into the time of spiritual grounding in our worship service, beginning with the sharing of joys and sorrows from our community. We start with a, a sorrow, a concern from Terry Gates. Terry says, my friend Mireya badly hurt her ankle six months ago and just started physical therapy. Terry asks that you please pray that it all works out for her. Next, we have another sorrow, a deep sorrow from Larry Freeman. Larry wants us to know that longtime member Ed Bruhard has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. The prognosis is not good as the cancer has started to spread. Larry also invites you to keep Ed and his family in your hearts and your prayers. And finally, a remembrance from Stephen Deering. Stephen is thinking of Emily Deering, the beloved grandmother of Rakesh and Raina, who passed on October the 2nd of last year. Stephen says, your presence and your spirit are deeply missed. I invite you now to move forward with me into a deeper spirit of prayer, centering, reflection. Spirit of love and life, that which moves through us, in us, and around us. We come together this morning in a time of uncertainty. There is true joy and true love and light in our lives. There is also a, an impending sense of turmoil in our country. It has been a struggle for us for several years, and most recently, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, has been incredibly challenging and stressful to us, and it has separated us from our natural sources of support. We know now this morning that also our president has been diagnosed with COVID, and this could bring up any number of feelings within us. Let us be gentle and patient with those feelings. Let us all bear in mind above all else the wellness of the Union, the United States of America, the safety and security of our country. Let's put that first, put our care and concern for each other first hold each other together in a time of turmoil and confusion. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. of three daughters. My oldest sister, the golden firstborn, looked like the Gerber baby with blonde hair and blue eyes. My mother called her the smart one. My middle sister had dark curly hair like my father's, and my mother would twirl her hair around her fingers, making perfect sausage curls like Shirley Temple's. Google that name and you'll see what I mean. My mother praised her as the musical talent with piano skills and a two octave range. Then there was me. My mother sighed at my straight hair, my energy, don't run, and singled me out for being left-handed. She called me the clumsy one. I was 22 months younger than the middle sister, and my mom thought it was funny to say things like, we always wanted a third child just not so soon. And my favorite, that's what happens when you skip church. 
Years later, my sisters and I realized that when she praised us, it was usually when speaking to one of us about the other. When I was older and married and pregnant with my first child, I asked her why she never said those things directly to me. She said that my father did enough of that for both of them, and she didn't want me to get a big head. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that we grew up thinking we were worthless. Our parents were the product of farm families where children were judged on their work and their contribution to the family. Children were not coddled. Our mother parented as she had been raised. Fortunately, we three sisters were strong and we had each other. But I know myself well enough to hear when her voice is burbling in the background of my thoughts. And that is true for many of us here this morning. This is when we all need to have compassion for ourselves, because regardless of all the messages we have received in our lifetimes, we can be grounded in our own self-love. So I don't, I don't know if you heard, but there's a presidential election underway right now. I want you to know that as we get closer to election day, we are going to be talking about it a lot. I know that this is a touchy subject and that many of us, myself included, are pretty tired of talking about it. However, the purpose of church is to explore life's big questions and we would be remiss to ignore our country's most pressing issue. We deserve an opportunity to spiritually reflect on the challenges of our world. That's what we do here. There is virtually no way to isolate ourselves from the political anxiety of our time. Hateful rhetoric and fear mongering have become practically the air that we breathe. The people of this nation are split into factions and living in vastly different versions of our country. Our media diets are increasingly segregated, leading to echo chambers that bring us to the conclusion that the people who don't agree with us must be crazy, mean, and or stupid. The discourse is confused by a subtext that is not universally understood. For example, the phrase law and order is understood to be, by some to be an implicitly racist statement, and others have no idea why. That's why it's called a dog whistle. Only some of us can hear it. Both sides are convinced that they are fighting for the soul of our nation, for their safety and their freedom, and we are all afraid. No matter where we fall on the political spectrum, I think we all think that we're right. And we think that those who do not agree with us are wrong and there is no middle ground. The time when political discourse is limited to binary thinking. It's 100% this or 100% that with no option in between. There's no room for nuance right now and everywhere we turn, there is yet another line in the sand. We are constantly bombarded with conflicting information making us increasingly apprehensive and paranoid. The stark political divisions of our time leave many Unitarian Universalists feeling conflicted. We might feel that our values align with a certain political party, but we also believe in the worth and dignity of every person and interdependence. How do we reconcile these beliefs with the rage and the fear for those who do not share our political perspective? And I wanna be very explicit here. I am not implying that we all share the same political perspective. There is a diversity of political thought in our congregation and in every religious tradition. What I intend to say is regardless of which party we feel our understanding of Unitarian Universalism most closely aligns with, we feel conflicted by the deep divisions in our nation. This is not a question of which political party is more inherently compatible with Unitarian Universalism, but how we are faithful to our UU values when we are being pitted against each other and it feels like life or death. And perhaps for some of us, it really is life or death. Our political rhetoric combined with the existential crisis of the COVID pandemic and now a president who has COVID exacerbates these feelings of isolation, fear, and hopelessness. 
scaling the walls that we place between ourselves and others has always been difficult. Humans find it easy to be divided and to seek what we want at the exclusion of what others need. Unitarian Universalism names interconnectedness as a principle because it takes effort. It is an aspirational goal. An intentional focus on interdependence is a nudge in the direction of communal health. Religions don't name things that are readily apparent. It's named because it's not readily apparent. As Unitarian Universalists, we have aligned ourselves with a covenant that affirms that we are interdependent. And in the face of division amplified by fear and paranoia, the emotional labor of interdependence is just short of impossible. And yet, our faith still calls us to this work. We share a common origin and we share a common destiny. Our interdependence cannot be severed, and so it is time that we act like it. There's a cluster of social sciences that conceptualize human relationships as systems where all parts work together to constitute a whole. Often this is likened to family systems, and as Teresa demonstrated in her reflection, families are messy. All human relationships are messy. And when a system becomes toxic, the only way to improve the overall health is to nurture the healthy components. Dysfunctional relational systems resist change by attempting to pull everyone into toxic behaviors. And one of the mechanisms of maintaining dysfunction in a relational system, whether it's a family, a community, a friendship, a nation, one of the mechanisms for maintaining dysfunction in that system is codependency. In a codependent relationship, toxic behaviors reinforce each other. The members of that relationship and that relational system depend on each other for approval, for affirmation, and a sense of identity. The need for external emotional support is so great that it enables bad behavior. Bad behavior is tolerated because any disruption of that behavior might mean a disruption in that external validation, and so the cycle continues. No one wants to rock the boat because they have come to rely on each other to feel loved. In a codependent relationship, peace is prioritized over well-being but it isn't really peace, it is the absence of conflict. Our political system and the rhetoric that surrounds it have become toxic. And the American family is sick. We are all a part of that toxic system. There is currently no opt out option other than willful ignorance. And when relationships get strained and emotions run high, some of us find it hard to take a clearly defined position because we think it pulls against our stated goal, the Unitarian Universalist goal of interdependence. But it has to be possible for us to say what behavior aligns with our understanding of Unitarian Universalism. Affirming our interdependence does not mean that we have to avoid tough conversations or refuse to take a position. In our efforts toward group cohesion in the name of our seventh principle or in the name of American identity, we often confuse interdependence with codependence. We do not have to prove our Unitarian Universalism by bending over backwards to accommodate people whose values do not align with our own. Over the past few months, I have gotten so many questions about how we love people who don't agree with us. And I think the first step is to clarify what we really mean by love. In times like this, it's important to turn to spiritual masters who know more about things than we do. RuPaul Charles is arguably the most famous drag queen the world has ever known. He has a massive following and an Emmy award-winning public platform. And on the surface, that platform is a reality show about drag queens competing for a cash prize and a title. But what the show is really about is self-love. Every season includes tearful interviews with performers recounting tales of childhood bullying and abuse at the hands of loved ones. 
Some even talk about considering suicide. And each of these stories is a powerful testament to learning to love yourself. Over 12 seasons of the show, every episode of RuPaul's Drag Race ends with the following reminder. If you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you gonna love somebody else? Beautifully said. If you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you gonna love somebody else? Well, you can't. You can't love somebody else if you don't love yourself. Each of us has a need for love and acceptance that can only be filled by ourselves. And if that love is outsourced to another, we become willing to hide or to jettison things about ourselves that we fear might be disappointing to that outside source. A relationship that requires us to make ourselves small in order to feel loved is not love, it's codependence. In codependent relationships, boundaries become blurred. Relationships in which there are no boundaries, or the boundaries are not strong enough, are lopsided. The lack of boundaries leads to resentment and resentment is not love. Boundaries are love. Boundaries are what keep us authentically connected. Love of another is grounded in love of self. Loving yourself means being clear and honest, which means being able to disagree. It might seem counterintuitive, but boundaries are what allows us to be interdependent. A system is the sum of its parts. And if the parts lose their distinctions, the system can no longer function in a healthy manner. Loving other people means loving yourself enough to set and maintain healthy boundaries. We stop needing other people to agree with us. We stop needing to avoid conflict. And that doesn't mean that we intentionally seek conflict. It just means that we have developed a tolerance for discomfort that allows us to be who we really are. If we try to fit ourselves into the image of what we think someone else wants us to be or what they've told us they want us to be, then we become a caricature of ourselves. We can only love as our authentic selves. Love for people that do not share our political opinions begins with loving ourselves by setting boundaries. We can set boundaries on what we will discuss with whom. If you know that a certain person is going to goad you or going to try to hook you emotionally, you do not have to subject yourself to that bad behavior. You can put boundaries that prevent that bad behavior from impacting you. We can set boundaries about how much we expose ourselves to outrage. You do not have to check the news and social media the moment that you wake up and every 30 minutes thereafter for the rest of the day. If a candidate's positions put your physical, mental, or spiritual health at risk, you do not have to take time to consider their candidacy based on how their economic stance, whatever. You don't have to consider somebody who is out to hurt you as a good candidate. Nor should you have to defend that boundary to anyone else. I understand the UU impulse to love everyone, and I agree that we are called to that work, but there is a difference between loving and being nice. We are called to love people, not their behaviors. Loving other people doesn't mean that you have to agree with them. You don't have to pretend to agree with them. You don't have to gloss over bad behavior or avoid conflict. Love means drawing and maintaining boundaries that allow us to show up as our authentic selves. And the first step to loving others is you have to love yourself. That is true of our, all relationships, including and most especially as it relates to our current political context. If you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you gonna love somebody else? And as RuPaul says, can I get an amen? May it be so. Amen, Reverend Mandy. Everyone, please join in singing our final hymn for this morning, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. When our heart is in a holy place, when our 
heart is in a holy place. We are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, when we trust the wisdom in each of us, every color, every creed and kind, and we see. going out into this world and take with you some of the joy and the love that you have found here. Let's do what we can for the health of our nation by bolstering up those healthy relationships with those around us. Let's move from a place of love for each other that begins with love for ourselves. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.